Good afternoon. I am Robert Raven. I have rejoined the Board of Directors of the American Constitution Society, which I am uh, very excited and, and proud of. I want to thank our Executive Director, our President, uh, Caroline Fredrickson, and the Board for the stewardship of this organization, the day in and day out cultivation and caretaking that uh, brings us to uh, a, a joyous conference like this. Uh, but provide so much programming and substance to, to the American public. So thank you very much, Caroline, for your leadership. We, we are about to get an unprecedented and memorable insight into the character, mind, strategy, and tactics of three women whose work has changed the course of America. Most people, most professionals who work hard, play by the rules and succeed, still get, I think, still get restless over that existential question, do I matter? We are about to have a conversation with three brilliant attorneys for whom the question has been answered in the affirmative. Literally millions of Americans and maybe citizens of other nations live in a freer, more tolerant, more equal country because of the diligence, perseverance, and commitment of Mary Bonato, Pamela Carlin, and Roberta Kaplan. <laughs> and they're still young. Men and women in our communities wake up able to hold the hands of the person we love, vote for the candidate we choose, adopt whom we wish, care for the love we choose because of the hearts and minds of these three. Attorneys Kaplan, Carlin, and Bonato have, in my view, done and are doing the Lord's work and matter a great deal to so many of us. Our scholar, I'm not going in order, our scholar, Professor Carlin, has been thinking, writing, and explaining creative approaches to solving intractable problems in the law for 25 years, maybe more. A Supreme Court clerk, a fighter at the Inc. Fund, a professor, author, speaker, scholar, griot, oracle, and standard setter. Professor Carlin has made her mark on the nation's laws around voting rights, employment discrimination, and so many other areas. She is now investing her deep talents at the United States Department of Civil Rights, which hasn't seen the likes of her in a long time, <laughs> where she is Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and we're so proud of her. Our strategist, Mary Bonato, has been the Civil Rights Project Director at GLAAD for 24 years. Her litigation and advocacy has changed the course of this nation, from establishing the right to civil unions in Vermont, to striking the ban on civil marriages for same-sex couples, and successful challenges to Section 3 of DOMA. And she has made me personally speechless when my boyfriend, who lives in Maryland, and I live in DC, and we now have same-sex marriage, says, so now what? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Congressman Barney Frank aptly pointed out that Mary is our, meaning LGBT, Thurgood Marshall. Our litigator, Roberta Robbie Kaplan is a skilled and successful commercial attorney with expertise in regulatory investigations, criminal prosecutions, and the civil interplay that follows such inquiries. She's at the top of her game in this competitive field and brought her legal prowess to the seminal case of United States v. Windsor, in which the Supreme Court ruled the DOMA in part violated equal protection. Thank you so much for your participation this morning. Thank you for the work that you do. Well, thank you all so much for coming today. Today is actually a historic day and a day to celebrate. Uh, and we'll, I, I want to start by saying it's a day to celebrate because today is Edie Windsor's 85th birthday. Um, and uh, timing is everything. Uh, now, last night, for those of you who are here to see last night's living room conversation, you'll remember uh, that Justice Sotomayor and Teddy Shaw talked about 
how they would never have expected to be on the stage. Uh, they would never have expected to have been director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund or a Supreme Court justice. Um, but even more so for Edie Windsor than for them, because you'll remember Justice Sotomayor talked about how they were born into the civil rights movement, a movement that was already vibrant, that had already achieved some of its greatest successes, the successes that we celebrate this year with the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 60th anniversary of Brown against uh, Board of Education. But of course, Edie Windsor was not born into the middle of a civil rights movement for the LGBT community. Uh, and so uh, the journey of her life in some ways is even more remarkable than the journey of those of us who came of age already beneficiaries of civil rights movements. Uh, so we want to talk about how did we get to where we are and where are we going from here. Uh, and it's useful to remember for those of you who are younger than me, and every year when I come to uh, the ACS convention, more of you are younger than me uh, than the year before. This is my 14th. Uh, year coming, and so I'm amazed at how many of you were not even born when I first started coming. No, how many of you are much younger than I am, and how few of you are older than I am. Um, uh, and uh, so you don't have to be as old as Edie even to remember uh, how things were. And I wanted to start by telling two stories that will set the stage for where we found ourselves uh, in Windsor. The first of them is from the year I was clerking, and that's uh, the year of Bowers against Hardwick, uh, which is, in many ways, I think it's fair to say, the legal nadir of the modern gay rights movement. It was a year in which, if you went to the oral argument, the swing justice on the Supreme Court asked questions like, if we allow gay people to have sex in the privacy of their own homes, what's going to happen to people having sex in public bathrooms and in automobiles? as if only gay people did that. Um, uh, and in which uh, uh, the justice who wrote the Supreme Court's opinion could say that the idea that the rights of gay people had anything to do with ordered liberty in this country was at best facetious. And a year in which the Chief Justice of the United States could say in his concurrence uh, in the Windsor decision that uh, he could thought it, 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 no, it made no sense to claim that gay people had any rights because after all, sodomy was a more malign crime than rape. That's the world that I grew up in. It's the world that I came of age in as a, a law student and the like. And so the idea that 25 or 30 years later, we'd be sitting on a stage talking like this was just not even in, in people's contemplation. But if you fast forward, uh, to the Supreme Court's decision in Lawrence against Texas, which was 25 years later. Um, uh, a case argued, by the way, by former chairman of the ACS board, uh, Paul Smith. Um, the courtroom was totally different. The questions were totally different. The only two questions that I remember that people thought were tremendously inappropriate were ones that Justice Scalia asked, uh, in which he said, well, uh, you say that this is uh, part of ordered liberty. Suppose a lot of people wanted to sit on flagpoles. Would that give them a fundamental right? At which point all you could think was calling Dr. Freud, calling Dr. <laughs> Freud, coming to Dr. Freud, we have a problem here. Um, and, uh, then a, uh, and then a question at the very end in which the Chief Justice asked whether if we allowed uh, gay people to have the same rights in their intimate relationships that straight people had, this would have any implication on who could teach kindergarten. Um, but the thing I remember most from that argument is uh, not the argument this itself, but something that happened right after the argument. And we were standing in the well of the courtroom, and the argument had gone very, very well for our side and very badly for the other side. And I was standing with Walter Dellinger, who many of you know, uh, and we were standing there smiling, and Linda Greenhouse, who was then the uh, reporter, Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times came over and Walter said, what did you think the most interesting thing about that argument was? And without missing a beat, Linda said, the bar section. What did she mean by that? Well, what she meant by that is virtually every lesbian, gay, or bisexual clerk in the Supreme Court's history had come back to see the oral arguments in Lawrence against Texas. We were all sitting in the well of the court. And when the justices came out from behind the velvet curtain, they looked out at us, and you could see on their faces that they saw something different, and especially Justice O'Connor, who was going. 
<laughs> and, I, and, and I said this, you know, and, and, and I said, and, and Linda said, and you could see her looking as she came down the line. I said, yeah, Walter, and when she looked at you, she was very surprised indeed. <laughs> um, but that is the, the difference. Um, some of you may know that I, I spoke at um, DOJ Pride Day earlier this month, and I said, what was the difference between the time of Bowers and the time of Lawrence? It's not that the words of the Constitution changed. And then I realized something, which is actually the words of the Constitution did change between uh, the time of uh, Bowers and the time of Lawrence, which was we ratified the 27th Amendment to the Constitution, which provides uh, for the way in which pay raises should be uh, calculated for members of Congress. And I said, you know, even if you're a really clever textualist, you probably can't get anything out of the 27th Amendment that tells you why gay people should have the same rights as straight people to intimate uh, life decision making. And then I said, yeah, but if you take the words varying the compensation, which are the key words in the 27th Amendment, you can rearrange the letters to get 10 gay companions thrive. <laughs> And so if you're a literalist rather than a literalist, uh, this amendment actually does help us. But seriously, folks, um, what changed between 1986 and 2003 and what has continued to change is that gay people have come out. And as a result of coming out, uh, the Supreme Court justices moved in a kind of Donald Rumsfeldian way from treating gay people as unknown unknowns to treating us as known knowns, people who had worked for them, people who had argued in front of them, people they cared about, people they respected, and of course, in my case, people whose clients they regularly ruled against. Um, but that change is a huge part of how we got to the place we got to. It's not just a story about Edie Windsor coming out. It's not just a story about millions of people coming out. It's also a story about how that energy was harnessed. Uh, and uh, I want to turn the um, discussion over now to Mary Bonato, who we came to call in Windsor our amicus whisperer because of her job there. But she really is the movement whisperer, the person who has taken uh, a movement and turned it into a, a legal juggernaut. So Mary, how did we get from uh, Lawrence and Goodridge to uh, Windsor and where we are today? One line? Practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great to hear what you have to say, and it is absolutely true that tremendous progress has been made, although, of course, we're going to want to talk about everything else that remains to be done. But even apart from all of that, you know, it's one thing to focus on the Supreme Court, but before you ever get a chance to argue your case in the Supreme Court, unless you want it to come out like Bowers versus Hardwick, there's so much groundwork that has to be done in advance. And really, so this is a story that everyone in this room has contributed to, and so many people beyond this room, because everything that everyone has done, not only in terms of coming out, but then thinking about getting those local non-discrimination ordinances passed, I know, sounds really ridiculous now, right? Except that it's not ridiculous in the 29 states that don't have any kind of non-discrimination law in effect. You know, but getting those non-discrimination laws passed and enforced and defended when they went out to referendum and dealing with the problem of violence, and I'm not just talking about Matthew Shepard, I'm just talking about when I started at GLAAD in 1990, it was not uncommon for me to have somebody call me and say, I was at the Dunkin' Donuts buying coffee and I got attacked by another patron. Or these two women who said, I went out to buy a used car, and the used car salesperson realized we were a lesbian couple and pulled a car antenna off a roof and, and came after us. I mean, that's, you have to work through all of this stuff. You've got to work through the prejudices around parenting and everything to, before that you even have a chance at a fair conversation with a court about why these principles of equality, of liberty apply to us. So there's this whole process, in my view, that has gone on, this is not the funny part, sorry. There's this whole process that's been going on of trying to humanize gay people as individuals and then to sort of bring in the family aspects as well. And it has not been easy. And so really all that state by state work uh, and really community by community work that has gone on and so many people have participated in has, along with all the coming out in all these different contexts, has really led us to the point where we could actually go to a court and feel like maybe we would get a fair hearing. When I was on my first week in the job at GLAAD in 1990. I heard from a lesbian couple in Western Massachusetts who had been together 10 years and they wanted to marry. And I said, yep, 
totally, yep, you should be right, that you should have that right, yep, wrong time, not doing it. But, and I had that conversation many times over the years before I actually filed any marriage cases because I felt like we were still dealing with the car antenna people. We were still dealing with justices who would look over their papers at me, you know, and think, oh my God, that's a lesbian talking, that's a lesbian talking, that's a lesbian talking. <laughs> and I could feel it, and I could see it in the dissents after we won um, with all the Latin quotations. But anyway, I... Um, <laughs> So there is just so much of that work, and that is how we have made this progress. But of course, there's nothing to invigorate progress and to make you really feel like you have momentum, like winning a Supreme Court case, uh, you know? Um, and yeah. And you know, I, what can I say? I do think the Windsor decision is a triumph and it was marvelously litigated from beginning to end. And it's also just beyond exciting that it, you know, it's one of several now where the Supreme Court has essentially stated, we don't like double standards being imposed against gay people. We don't like the idea of writing gay people out of the Constitution and the right to seek uh, non-discrimination protections you know, in Colorado. Uh, we don't like the idea that only gay people don't have a right to enjoy their sexual intimacy and you know, liberties. And we don't like you know, having the federal government and the Congress single out only one class of state licensed marriages for disrespect and then disrespecting them across the board. So anyway, the strategy from my perspective um, is really just working it through and getting to the point where people believe there's really a problem here. There's a problem in how gay people are being treated. It's a problem that has to be solved because it contravenes our shared values. And really getting to a point where a court as well, and a legislature as well, will say this discrimination is wrong. And that's a point where we're very much in play nationally right now, and it's a great thing. So, Robbie, why don't you take us from there to the decision day in Windsor, how you approached the case, what your thoughts were about what you were hoping to accomplish, what you thought you could accomplish, what you thought wasn't going to happen. First of all, let me say, and I'm listening to you, I didn't know you'd been studying Kabbalah lately. In terms of your letter, your letter analysis, but it, you're getting very good at it. Um, look, you know, uh, Pam is absolutely right, uh, obviously, uh, that the world has changed in incredible ways, uh, not only in Edie Windsor's lifetime, not only in our lifetime, but frankly, even in the past year. I, I was just talking to Edie yesterday, um, and she tells the story often about how when and how she decided to bring the case. Um, and the story that she tells is that she knew, uh, she had a great financial plan, and she knew that she was gonna have an estate tax problem. She didn't realize the size of it. Uh, and when she realized how much money she had to pay to the federal government solely because she was gay, a tax essentially on being gay because of DOMA, uh, one of the many reasons why she was a great client, she says she felt indignant, her word, um, and that she wanted to do something about it. And she, uh, she said that one of the things that helped persuade her was there was a documentary that had been made uh, just at the end of Thea Spire's life called uh, Edie and Thea, A Very Long Engagement, which I would recommend to anyone, it's on Netflix. Um, and that that documentary made her feel that she had a documented marriage. And because she had a documented marriage, she felt that she had the ability to go and bring this lawsuit. Think about that for a second. That was only a few years ago. Uh, I don't think there's a gay couple anywhere today who's married who thinks they need a documentary uh, to document their marriage. Uh, I'm not even sure people think they need a marriage certificate to document their marriage. If you're a gay couple who's married today, you're married. Uh, so even in that brief period, even in the several, the few years in which we litigated the case, uh, the world has changed at just such lightning speed. Um, and obviously, as Pam said, the reason is because one person, can, and Edie said this herself, one person came out one day, one brave person, and then another person, and then another person, and then another person. And once you have someone who's your family member, or your colleague, or your neighbor, or your friend who's gay, it's pretty hard to accept the fact that they can be discriminated against simply because of who they are. Um, so in terms of this case, um, my strategy has been, I had a post-it on my computer uh, for much of the case in, in my office that said it's all about Edie Stupid. Uh, borrowing from the Clinton campaign. Um, and, and that was really, I think, for two reasons, frankly. Uh, first of all, uh, I thought um, that the facts of Edie's life 
uh, both after she met, in the 44 years she was with her spouse, Thea Spire, and frankly, even before she met uh, Thea Spire, told such a compelling story uh, about the path that gay people have followed in our country, about what a marriage really is, who wouldn't want to have a marriage like they had. Uh, Thea was essentially a quadriplegic by the time she died. Who wouldn't want to have a spouse like Edie Windsor, God forbid, uh, if that happened to you? Um, so I thought the facts were incredibly important and incredibly persuasive. And then I think on top of that, frankly, as I think back on it, I think it was a way for me to separate myself from what was going on. Um, as a lawyer, I very much believe that my duty uh, is to my clients um, and that what I do is represent clients and it's all about my clients. Um, and I think I wanted to separate my own issues. I'm married and I have a son and I was, uh, in 1986 when Bowers came out, I was in college and was completely freaked out about the idea that I would ever live my life as an open gay person. Um, so I think I wanted to separate that because I felt that it would impinge on my ability to really do what we had to do in the case. Um, since then, and probably even during the case, that became impossible, obviously. Um, uh, the idea, uh, again, following up on what Mary and Pam said, that I would be sitting on the stage today uh, as an out lesbian, a partner of Paul Weiss, married with a son. Uh, if you had told me that in Cleveland, Ohio in the 1980s in high school, I would have told you you needed to stop smoking whatever it is you were smoking. <laughs> Um, so it really is, it, it's, it's, these stories of journeys, I think, um, are so important, and Edie's story, for so many reasons, was really the perfect story to tell. Um, so it's fitting we're doing this on her 85th birthday. Um, I couldn't figure out what to give her for her birthday. She has, she's allergic to flowers, she has a lot of food allergies, um, but we sent her today a very big bottle of vodka to celebrate. <laughs> Mary, you were gonna, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I wanted to chime in on, a, on another point, which is, you know, when you're talking about a minority, you need engagement in all three branches of government. You know, you need the courts involved, you need the legislatures and the executives to be weighing in and to say these issues are important, even if they don't necessarily agree with where you are, and you need the court of public opinion. And, it, and obviously, no progress happens without a lot of conflict. And we might be happy right now, but boy, there's been a lot of conflict. And I just wanted to step back for a second because you know, Robbie putting that post-it on our computer was really essential because we have also really needed to rely on extremely brave people who are willing to be litigants in cases at a time when <laughs> these ideas seemed ridiculous, crazy, or infuriating and terrifying to people and where they really did, in some cases, rightly feel that their safety was endangered. So after you know, the hope that came out of Hawaii, the Hawaii Supreme Court in 1993, you know, we ended up with the Federal Defense of Marriage Act in 1996, and it's very rich you know, House report being very clear about exactly what was going on in their minds, uh, moral disapproval of, of gay people and an intent to encourage uh, heterosexual relationships over gay relationships, et cetera. And it was really, it's important to think about where does one go next after something like this? And as I mentioned, I, I didn't want to file a case my first week on the job, a marriage case, but I did in Vermont in 1997, when it still wasn't clear what the ultimate outcome would be in Hawaii. And I have to say, this is, you know, this is, believe it or not, I'm intending to pay some homage to the courts here and to principle and why it's so important that ACS and all of us remain so committed to these principles as living things that aren't confined by 18th century standards. Uh, you know, after Alaska and Hawaii amended their constitutions in November 1998, two weeks later, uh, along with Beth Robinson and Susan Murray in Vermont, we were in front of the Vermont Supreme Court arguing our marriage case there uh, on behalf of three really brave, very different kinds of couples. Um, and we didn't get what we wanted. We got a uh, compromise from the court. We, they said, yeah, sure, you're entitled to all the same rights and protections, but we're gonna leave it to the legislature about what they're going to do. And you know, at the time I was really disappointed, but I have to say, then watching the legislature work this through, uh, and what should they do with this? Should they just say, forget it, you know, go back to court, you're gonna lose, we can read that in the decision, uh, or would they really grasp this opportunity? And they grasped the opportunity to do something. They didn't do marriage like we wanted them to, but they did something that had never been done before. 
And at that time in our country, the idea that they said you can have all of the same rights, protections, and responsibilities under state law as married couples have was shocking. But it, and, it, and it wasn't this yes, no on marriage. It was a way of continuing the conversation to think and to do this teaching about what is actually encapsulated in marriage. And it's so much more than rights and benefits. But that's part of it. And that is part of how uh, gay people and their families have been so systematically disadvantaged is not having access to it. But anyway, it's, it kept the conversation going in a very productive way. And then I, I also just have to say this. I remember watching two full days of debate in the Vermont Senate where there had been two different proposals to amend the Vermont Constitution that would both have shut down anything that we had just won in the, in the Baker versus Vermont case. And I saw legislators stand up who were obviously racked with this. It felt so weird, this whole conversation felt so weird to them. And they didn't know what to do. They were drawing on their experiences of their grandmother, the Catholic in this Protestant town who people threw rocks at on the way to church. They were talking about their kids and, what, and having talked to their kids about it. And their kids said, what is the big deal? These are just people. And I, and I began to really feel this enormous confidence that when push came to shove and you had this fusion of principle and the real persons behind it, the reality of it, that we would have a chance at winning. And it's a big part of why um, we also then moved forward in Massachusetts and filed Goodridge versus Department of Public Health. And I will say this about Goodridge. Um, you know, Massachusetts has this great constitution. John Adams inspired, has multiple equality provisions, all really good stuff. In the end, we needed the court to say, as it did, and for the first time ever, breaking this historic barrier, saying marriage is a vital social institution, Commonwealth imposes great responsibilities and protections, expects the same in return, but then goes on to say something I had never, I thought I might never see in my lifetime, which was the Massachusetts Constitution affirms the dignity and equality of all individuals. It forbids the creation of second-class citizens. Commonwealth has proffered reasons for its discrimination. None of them suffice. And it was in that idea that I think a lot of us had who work in these LGBT legal organizations that we would have to break through somewhere. We'd have to get to marriage itself and eventually build a patchwork nationwide where we would be able to you know, eventually um, seek a national resolution, one uniform rule everywhere. But I will say this, I'll say one more thing about Massachusetts, which is we had a really, we had a fairly difficult six months getting to the implementation of the ruling. There were five lawsuits, there were constitutional convention proceedings. It was, you know, it was a very interesting time. But here's what happened on May 17, 2004, and same-sex couples started marrying. What happened was an outbreak of joy. It was joy and everybody, so many more people got it than before. Speaking of Walter Dellinger, last night he said, one of his law professors talked to him about the, the normative power of the actual. Um, the way that actually we talk about it in Massachusetts <laughs> is uh, there's nothing like seeing same-sex couples married to make the argument for same-sex couples marrying. And I do think that that has been, that, that has been certainly one key point in moving us forward and getting to the point then when we were able to think about challenges to the federal government's discrimination then against those real marriages. So one question that I've always wondered about is the extent to which the decision to focus on marriage was a strategic decision versus a decision based on a belief that it was the most important right. I mean, how did you go about thinking about the decision to focus on marriage rather than employment or other family law obligations or the like? I'm so grateful for that question for so many reasons. So, you know, I, um, I certainly have done plenty of marriage work. You would not believe all the other work I've done that nobody ever mentions. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm out there fighting these ballot measures. I've brought tons of employment discrimination cases and public accommodation cases. I mean, I feel like my organization, which is based in New England, we have such a wide spectrum of work and First Amendment work and schools work and youth work, and we always have. So personally, I believe that in our and the legal part of our movement, we really have been walking and chewing gum at the same time. We've done lots of work, and it is absolutely also true that the media has been relentlessly focused on marriage, and it's... It's June. 
it's crucible of conflict. I mean, it's juicy stuff, you know, was edgy and so on. Um, and I think that really has brought a lot of attention to it. But I will also say that here's another thing about the marriage work. If you compare 2003, when we won in Massachusetts, um, to, you know, 10 years later, you know, a whole bunch more states have done non-discrimination, not nearly enough. There are now 500 uh, local, state, and national LGBT and HIV-related organizations um, who are doing work across the country and all kinds of, with all kinds of different communities. Um, there's been a lot of growth and development. You know, there are bullying laws in 49 states. So a lot of good things have happened, even with this focus on marriage. It doesn't mean that we're all big enough, far from it, to do everything that should be done. But I certainly, I personally, Pam, don't feel like there was a decision made to focus on marriage. It was to actually, okay, we're gonna brace ourselves and deal with this, because it has to be done. We kept track of, you know, we keep track of our calls and who calls and what they're calling about, and it was just really clear to us that a third to a half of the calls we received would potentially go away if people had the right to marry. And it was just too consequential. It was, you're, you're together 40 years, and your spouse, your partner dies, and the pension dies with him, and there goes your economic security. And plus, you know, we were constantly hammered, as others have been too, about from gay people who wanted that freedom to be able to marry the person they love and stand up and say that. So one thing, Robbie, that it was really striking, because Windsor was not your first attempt to persuade a court to recognize a marriage. You had been involved in the New York marriage litigation as well, is this, bizarre shift, I think, in the course of the marriage litigation you did from an argument that the reason gay people shouldn't be given the right to marry is gay people are immoral, to the uh, argument that the reason gay people shouldn't be given the right to marry is marriage is to deal with the immorality of heterosexual people. Um, and so, you know, that it's the kind of what I refer to as the reckless, feckless, a uh, straight man who needs to be forced to support his children, that's the entire explanation for marriage, and since gay people tend not to have children by accident, they don't need marriage to make sure they'll support their kids. Exactly. Um, and so I wonder how you kind of... At least as far as we know, gay people are having kids by accident. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Could happen. It's always a way of explaining it. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> Oops. Um, so how did you approach dealing with this kind of shifting sense of gay people and their relationships to marriage in the, in the oral arguments and in the briefs you did? Well, first of all, I, I agree with Mary completely that all that other work was important and needs to be done, needs to continue to be done. But I actually think, and have always thought this, that there's something incredibly symbolically and philosophically important about marriage. Uh, for gay people. And, and it's not to say that all gay people should get married or want to get married. I'm married, marriage is hard. That, that, that's not the point. Uh, the, the point is that, um, well, it, it goes back to the brief. There was a brief that was filed in the trial court in Windsor by the other side, and they made these, this argument that you don't really know who gay people are, you can't really figure it out, it's really ambiguous, it's not really a class of people. Um, I think it's one of the only times in my career I wrote a sentence in a brief in response that just said, really, question mark? Because uh, it seems to me when someone tells you they're gay, we pretty much know what that means. Um, and, and of course what that means is being gay is defined by who you choose to love and who you choose to live your life with. And uh, whether or not you're, you like marriage or you don't like marriage or you're divorced or separated or whatever, uh, the truth of the matter is the way our society recognizes that legally is through marriage. And so for gay people to have equality in marriage, it seemed to me, was so incredibly symbolically and philosophically important uh, for almost all the other areas, again, whether or not people wanted to get married or not, because it was a, a concession, it is now, thank God, a concession uh, that when it comes to what it is that makes people gay, uh, gay people have equal dignity to everyone else. Um, in terms of the arguments, the responsible or irresponsible procreation, the various arguments that were made, you know, I think the biggest uh, kind of interesting observation you can make there is the arguments just kept getting abandoned along the way. Uh, so it went, as you said, from gay people being just evil and immoral and you know, preying on children uh, to arguments that uh, really that you have to limit marriage to straight people because straight people are so irresponsible uh, that they're gonna have kids uh, out of marriage. And don't ask me how any straight couple 
uh, who gets pregnant, a woman who gets pregnant accidentally is going to choose to get married or not get married because Edie Windsor could or couldn't. I, don't, I, don't, I still fail to see that logic. Um, to today, uh, which is frankly, there's really not a lot left. I mean, you even saw this in the course of Windsor. Arguments kept get abandoning along the way. There were you know, five or six more supposed justifications for, for Windsor in the district court brief uh, than there were in the appellate court brief than there were in the Supreme Court brief. Um, and that's, I think it's just a, another example of what's been going on. Again, once you accept the fact that people have equal dignity, what possible good reason could there be or legitimate reason could there be for treating them differently under the law? So, you know, to quote uh, Satchel Paige, one of my favorite legal philosophers, uh, let whomsoever riches sit around recollecting I'm looking down the line. And so I thought we might pivot and turn to talking about where we're going from here. Um, one thing that, of course, I think none of us would have expected at this time last year is the sheer velocity of the change. I think everybody thought when the Supreme Court came down with Windsor, we would go back to doing maybe some Section 2 DOMA recognition cases, and there would be a couple of cases filed, and there would be mixed results and everything. And are you as stunned by the velocity and the direction of the change so far as I am, or did you foresee this? I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, I can't say that I foresaw it, but I certainly believed, because we also had done DOMA litigation for people in Massachusetts, that where we could have filed a marriage case and did not, that getting rid of DOMA, that moving into federal court on relationships and having equal protection apply in the context of those relationships was a really crucial building block for getting to marriage that people would see, the, the court would see that the country didn't freak out, quite the contrary, about just treating all marriages alike. And of course, then Windsor was even better than I thought it was going to be because of the passion in it. Uh, and the offense at the attempt to stigmatize and degrade same-sex couples was palpable. So in that sense, I think if anything, uh, or in part what happened is that Windsor unleashed a lot of pent-up demand. I mean, one of the things that I just love is in Arkansas, I know this was a state court case, but in Arkansas when the court ruled, that very same day there was a memo coming out from the HR department at the University of Arkansas about how same-sex couples could sign up for health insurance at last. It was just like people are so primed and so ready, but they have been held back by this, you know, huge infrastructure of constitutional bans. You know, uh, yes, you can say gay, but probably in some states not a lot more than that. So that's, you know, I really feel like we had the crucial building block. There's been pent up demand, and the country has been talking about this. So marriage is relatable, as Robbie said. It's something everybody gets about that's who gay people are, and it's relatable because marriage is in the vernacular, it's in the culture, and it's associated with joy and happiness. And it gets to the point where you feel kind of mean uh, and kind of rotten about trying to deprive other people of the chance to have that. Um, so I kind of wonder also whether for a lot of the judges who are deciding these marriage cases, nobody wants to be the last judge in America uh, to uh, uphold a ban, you know, it, it, and be referred to as the Roger Tawney of marriage equality. Um, and, and, and that's, Other than yeah. certain justices on the Supreme Court. Yes, well, yeah. The, 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 I'm not expecting a nine-zip opinion from the Supreme Court anytime soon on this. Um, it'll be more like Rumpelstiltskin, where people's heads will explode when they, when they, when they contemplate it. Um, but today is actually, Edie got a little bit of a birthday present today. And Mary, I don't know if you want to say a, a little bit about this, because a lot of people have been here at the convention uh, all morning and may not have heard uh, what happened. Well, the executive branch, you know, under President Obama's direction, has been working incredibly hard for the last year to implement the Windsor decision and to really dismantle all that discrimination that had built up over the years. And of course, DOMA's discrimination affected the private sector. It was imitated by the private sector. So there's been a lot to undo in order to make sure that married same-sex couples have the protections otherwise available through federal law. And they've worked very hard at it, every department. And, and so many of them have adopted something called the place of celebration rule, which is as long as your marriage is valid where it was performed, it's being respected by the federal government, like for tax. So just imagine, here you are, you're in Alabama, and you're, you're married in Massachusetts. You're married for tax purposes in Alabama, and that turns the tables and puts the spotlight on the state's discrimination against your marriage. They certainly look like they're doing something wrong rather than just imitating what the federal government has done. Anyway, they've been working incredibly hard, incredibly diligently. Lots of good things have happened across the federal government. And 
I will say that you know it's hard not to be incredibly pleased at everything they've done. And today, uh, the Attorney General submitted a report to the President saying, you know, here's what our process has been, and we feel like we really have done everything we can. Here's the final things we can do. We can take care of the Family Medical Leave Act and issue a regulation adopting a place of uh, celebration standard, and we're going to do a little bit more on veterans that we can do within the Secretary's discretion. Uh, and on Social Security, we're not going to, even though Social Security is one of those laws that really refers to what's the law in the state of domicile, meaning all those ban on time marriage laws, uh, we are going to apply another portion of the Social Security statute which says, as long as you have the right to inherit intestate, um, as would a husband or a wife, you're going to be considered a spouse for Social Security purposes. And that's going to sweep in married people, it's going to sweep in people in civil unions and registered domestic partnerships, and it's going to sweep in a bunch of other people who, even if their marriage is not respected, would be able to inherit uh, intestate under their state law. So they have done a great deal, uh, and, I, and they feel like they are at the end of the road, by and large. We will continue to engage with them. And so now that when it comes to veterans and Social Security, which are really the two last issues, those are issues where they're going to seek, uh, and others have already begun to seek um, specific statutory fixes. But you know what the real fix is? The real fix is in getting rid of the remaining state bans and amendments and making sure that the freedom to marry exists nationwide. So where do you see the next big battle, or are we going to take a little bit of a breather before we get there? What's the next big battle going to be in gay rights? Is it going to be trying to get legislation? Is it going to be employment discrimination? Well, you know, the president also did something incredible uh, the last day or two, which is he announced his intention of signing an executive order prohibiting uh, discrimination against gay people uh, by federal contractors. And, um, it, it's really a, an amazing fact, again, given that it's Edie's 85th birthday. Uh, when Edie was young um, and she moved to New York City, actually in order to be gay, like so many others, including myself, um, she realized that actually the biggest issue for her at the time was not being gay, it was the fact that she was a woman and she had never occurred to her that she was gonna have to support herself. She just assumed she'd get married and her husband would support her and so she needed a job. Um, and so she uh, uh, got, she had been good at calculus and algebra apparently in high school. So she decided to enter the mathematics graduate program at NYU. Um, and uh, she graduated from that uh, and became one of the first computer software programmers in the country. Um, and went on to a very distinguished career at IBM as a software programmer. Uh, what's so interesting about that fact is that even though she was totally in the closet uh, during her entire career at IBM, um, at least technically speaking, it was illegal for her to work at IBM uh, for her entire career because IBM at the time was a, a federal contractor, had contracts with the federal government, and there was a, cr a law that said uh, a federal contractor could not knowingly hire someone who was homosexual. Flash forward to today. Uh, today, uh, it, would be, it will be very shortly illegal for IBM to fire someone because they're homosexual. So just that kind of change within one person's lifetime and within our country's history is just, I mean, I guess I sound kind of sappy, but I can, it never ceases to amaze me. Um, so, uh, I, you know, discrimination is a big deal. It's ridiculous, uh, frankly, that there are states in which gay couples can get married, but, you can, but private employers can fire someone for, their, for being gay. That obviously makes no sense. Um, that has to be taken care of, it has to be taken care of, in my view, like everything in this movement, through a combination of cases, of litigation, of legislative action, of lobbying, and frankly of peer pressure, pressure popular opinion and peer pressure. It will happen, but that's a, a huge new area uh, that needs to be worked on. And then I think, and Edie has said this, and it's important to me, um, that it's time uh, within the gay community uh, to focus on those um, who are not as fortunate economically as, uh, certainly as the people sitting on the stage and many of the people in this room. Um, Edie has been very focused on uh, LGBT youth uh, who tell their parents, kids who tell their parents they're gay and they get kicked out of home and are living on the streets. Um, I just agreed to become the co-chair of GMHC in New York, which is essentially a poverty organization at this point. 
um, it's very important, I think, for us to continue to fight the fights and then to redirect some of those resources and attention and focus uh, to people who uh, have e inequality, not just because they're gay, uh, but have inequality because they're economically so much different and so much farther behind uh, than other parts of our society. Yeah, I mean. So uh, I'll, I'll tell one more story that I think pivots off of that that comes from the oral argument in Windsor. Um, as you can imagine, the oral argument in both the Perry case uh, and the Windsor case was a very hot ticket. Uh, and there weren't a lot of seats in the courtroom. Uh, and it used to be. So for example, when I went to see the oral argument in Lawrence, uh, for the public line, people had slept in line for two or three days to get tickets. And I was really, really eager to see the oral arguments. I had helped work on the case a little bit. And um, I, I flew in from California the day before, and I was very nervous about whether I could get up early enough. So like every half hour, all night long, I woke up. And at 4.30 in the morning, I thought, look, I'm not getting back to sleep. So I put on my jacket and stuff, and I went over to the court, and I turned out to be the second person in the lawyer's line uh, to get into the court, which got me a really good seat. Got me a really good seat. But by the time of Windsor, um, you know, we've had increased economic inequality in society and the 1% and all of that. And so for Windsor, uh, there were a lot of people who were hired to sit in the lines. Uh, and then you showed up to get your seat uh, from someone who had been there for hours. And what struck me the most is when we showed up um, for the argument in Windsor, at 5 a.m., the entire line was made up of homeless black guys sleeping under tarps who'd been recruited from shelters to sit in line all night. And by 7 a.m., when the Supreme Court police came on duty, all of them had been replaced by upper middle class and wealthy lawyers who wanted to see the case instead. And I was so struck by that, and then so struck by the fact that the week of Windsor, which is the triumph of civil rights for gay people was also the week of uh, Shelby County, which was the Supreme Court announcing that the second reconstruction didn't need, we, didn't, we could stop reconstructing. Everything had been reconstructed. Uh, Bull Connor was dead and we should stop worrying. Um, that I wonder how we think as a progressive movement more generally about how to tie together issues of race and poverty uh, of immigration and the like, um, because not everybody has the advantage that the gay community has, which is we have one tremendous advantage over a lot of the other groups that are, that are making calls on society for equality, and that is people wake up all the time to discover that their kids are gay. Very few upper middle class people wake up to find out that their children are poor. Very few citizens wake up to find out that their children are undocumented. Very few whites wake up to discover that their children are black. Strom Thurmond uh, to the contrary. Um, but, but I actually think this makes a huge difference because, you know, I, I, I was struck in the run up, and you will remember this because you had this exchange with the Chief Justice at the oral argument where he said, people seem to be falling all over themselves, to politicians are falling all over themselves to be on your side. And a lot of it was politicians who would write an op-ed that said, now that I've discovered that my son is gay, I believe in same-sex marriage. Um, but they don't say, now that I've discovered that somebody else's child is poor, I believe in uh, affordable health care for poor kids or the like. So how do we build on, like what lessons have we learned that could be applied more generally to uh, equality and dignity for everybody? It's a great question and it's one that needs to continue to be pursued. Yeah. You know, one thing, I have a lot of thoughts about it actually, um, and just to share a few. I mean, one thing that's been going on for quite some time now and it's still really very true in some parts of the country is that people have really felt like somebody's stepping on their neck. And it limits your vision when you're down on the ground and somebody's stepping on your neck um, legally and socially and so on. And you've got that fear of violence all the time and so on. And so I am truly hoping that as more gay people are more embraced 
by the communities and so on, and this you know, badge of non-citizenship is removed, that people will be able to contribute more um, and recognize the wider community in which they live. Having said all of that, there are, of course, LGBT people who are fighting all of these additional fights and who totally get that economic justice and equal opportunity are not things that are solved by saying, yes, we should have you know, equal rights under the law, that it's deeper than that, that you've got to look at entrenched prejudices and attitudes because those are the kinds of things that hold people back even when the law appears to be equal. And that's it's just as true um, of gay people as of anyone else. So I really feel like as we mature as a movement, that more people will get that and have the same kind of passion and fire in their belly about trying to secure equal opportunity for all um, as they have for you know, getting the government off their back and stop policing their bedrooms and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that those are things. The other thing I would just say, and I referenced this a little bit already, um, you know, it was really painful that Windsor and Shelby um, County were, you know, w within a day of each other. And there was, I want to go back to something that Justice Sotomayor said at oral argument in, I believe it was in Windsor. It might have been in Perry. It's all sort of a blur. But she essentially said, why do you want heightened scrutiny? Look what it's done. It was Windsor. Okay, it's, look what it's done. You know, you have this formal equality, but then it turns around and, you know, it protects all kinds of people who are not being subjugated. She didn't say it that way, but that's, that's the gist of it. Um, and I really think, what can I say? I really think that's right, and I think that's a really tough issue for us to, to thread, because on the one hand, you want that vindication of your citizenship and that this discrimination is impermissible. On the other hand, um, where does it lead? And equal opportunity, you know, just saying you have, excuse me, just saying you have equality under law, equal treatment under law, just papers over all of those much more systemic issues. And what I see, you know, ahead, and of course it's on us, it's been on us, and it's just becoming more and more of a prominent issue, is that whole attempt. You know, you asked earlier, Robbie, what, what is it that would cause somebody to fight you when they realize you're a gay person and you have inherent dignity and so on? Well, one of those things that would cause somebody to do that is number one, the, the attitudes that they continue to harbor and prejudice, and we see this in all, you know, as affects all minority persons. But then the other piece, the, on that point. Ah! The other piece is gonna <laughs> be that you're afraid that you're losing. Oh, I know, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the other piece, sorry. The other piece is what's going on now is the religious liberty piece, where, yeah, the, so the countervailing value you know, we have these shared values around you know, this nation overall, so we think, you know, about equal, you know, about fairness and non-discrimination and so on. But this religious liberty narrative is really dangerous, and you see it right now in the current version of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act has a gaping um, religious exemption. Uh, you see it in what happened in Arizona and Mississippi and was, has been attempted actually all over the nation to, to redo these state RIFRAs. Um, to really provide a license to discriminate. And I, yeah, I think you could easily project out in 10, 15, and 20 years this long-term campaign, just like there's been a long-term campaign to undermine Roe, just like there's been a long-term campaign to undermine you know, uh, voting rights and so on, that was, you know, and affirmative action, all kinds of things. You'll see the wearing away so that, again, uh, people's citizenship and freedoms and real opportunities are really compromised. So I view us as all very much in the same boat. Maddie? Look, I agree. I mean, you know, there was an article today in the Times about uh, conservatives really lobbying and organizing about this religious freedom arguments. Um, and then at the same time, there's an article in the Times, I think it's on the same page or the next page, saying that the Presbyterian Church uh, just voted to allow uh, gay couples to be married in their churches. So that's the world that we live in today. Both of these things are happening at once. Um, I think it, in terms of our movement, and you see this in other movements, it's very important that we not cede uh, the religious arguments to the right. Um, and this was a very important thing that Mary did in our amicus briefs. Um, it's not, the, the religious view is not just one view of this issue. There are a lot of religious people that believe, uh, as a matter of religious belief, that all people have dignity, that all people have dignity in God's eyes, and that, at least as a matter of civil law, all people have to be treated with equal dignity under the law. Uh, and one of the things we did in our case was to very uh, intentionally um, organize that. We had an amicus brief for the first time ever 
um, by mainstream religious groups. Uh, the Jewish conservative movement, uh, for the first time in its entire history, submitted an amicus brief in the Windsor case. Um, we had Presbyterian bishops, we had Episcopal bishops, and I think that kind of work needs to continue because not only do we need to make the legal arguments, but we need religious people arguing on our side as well. If you want to read a, a really interesting analog, you ought to go back and read the brief that the Southern Catholic bishops filed in Loving Against Virginia about how it was the right of, of it, it, making essentially a First Amendment claim that the Catholic Church should be able to perform interracial weddings in the South because their view of what dignity meant uh, required that all members of the church be entitled uh, to, ma to marriage. And it's, it's a really striking view. And I think it is one of those things that, as a movement, we've done a lot to reclaim the Constitution from conservative ways of thinking about the Constitution. We haven't done as much yet to reclaim religion, uh, which for most of uh, the sort of 20th century civil rights movements was on our side. And I think it's something that it's worth remembering that it, there's not a kind of secular religious divide on these issues. There is a liberal progressive right thinking versus uh, wrong thinking <laughs> divide on these issues. And it's, and, and, and it's worth remembering, it's worth remembering that. So we're coming towards the close of this program, and I wondered, Mary, if there was something else you wanted to say, and Robbie, and then I have uh, one last thing I want to say. Yeah, I want to say thank you um, to everyone, and I also want to say that no matter where you practice or what you do in life, that there are ways to, to contribute um, and to talk about these issues in informed ways. A place like ACS is a way to think about how to frame up issues in a way that people can understand them and understand the shared values and what's wrong with you know, any number of things that we're all trying to wrestle down out there. So I want to say thank you for everything you've done and thank you in advance for everything you're going to continue to do. I had this uh, epiphany the other day. I, you know, my favorite uh, book to read to my son when he was little uh, was A Dog with a Bone. A Dog Needs a Bone. Um, and I don't think that's entirely a coincidence. It's probably my personality. I always need to have a bone uh, that I'm chewing on. Um, I, I think the lesson is there's so many young lawyers in this room. Uh, Pam talked about the case in New York. That was a, not a victory on my part. It was a stunning defeat. Uh, we lost in 2006 in the New York Court of Appeals. Um, and if you told me in 2006 uh, that by 2011 we'd have legislative uh, action on marriage in New York and that in 2014 I'd be sitting here today again, I would have told you you needed to do something to be more realistic and have some therapy. I didn't think it was at all possible. Um, so, the, so I think the lesson is in all these, on all these issues is to keep on fighting, at least it's my lesson, is to keep on fighting. Um, ultimately you get there. Um, uh, but don't let it get you down and to keep on fighting the fights that everyone in this room is fighting every day. So my, my favorite childhood book, and the one I think about the most, is a book called Johnny Tremaine. Uh, and Johnny Tremaine is the story of a young boy growing up right before the Revolutionary War in the United States. And the re one of the reasons it's my favorite book is there's a line in the book that's used when the Sons of Liberty all meet to talk about what uh, what they need to do. And the line is, a man needs to stand up. A man needs room to stand up. And so what I want everybody to do right now is to stand up. Stand up. Everybody up, 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 up. If you can, I don't mean to be unfair. Okay, reach up to the stars. Reach down to lift up people below you. Reach to the left to thank the liberals reach to the right to grab the conservatives, <laughs> sit down, because we're about to go immediately into the next panel. And like workers at Walmart, if you have to go to the bathroom, it's on your own time. Uh, and we are going to move right into the next panel, which is beyond a broken beltway, state courts, legislatures, and cities as venues for progressive social change. And I want to thank Mary uh, and Robbie for being here and you as well.